Okay, so we got light rail, we got public transit, what others? In the, in the public sphere. Yeah, we'll, we'll skip that, we'll go on. Okay, so let's talk about personal cars. Somebody's mentioned car sharing, so some of you came here, you know, four or five of you piled in the same car and came here, right? So in effect, you were taking a car that gets 20 miles per gallon per person, and with three of you in that car, you were suddenly getting 60 miles per gallon per person, right? That's not bad. Uh, I used to own a little Honda Insight, the very first one, that was all streamlined. I got 60 miles per gallon with that car. But there was just one of me in it. Now, if somebody next to me had a great big Suburban, got 15 miles per gallon, and they had four people in it, what was their effective fuel economy per person? Same as my little insight, right? So the more people you can put into a vehicle, the more efficient it becomes, which is why buses and trains and things become very efficient. Now, the problem with, with what's the problem with Matt's bus system? Well, those are, yeah, those are things that we can fix. But the biggest problem with, the, with a bus is what? Yeah, let's see what I want to put here. Petroleum? Matt's biggest problem is, is it's, it's got a bus that's dependent on petroleum. Now, a light rail isn't, generally. It's powered by electric power. Now, some buses can be taken and converted over to natural gas, and if you go to Southern California, you see lots of the buses out there running around with sort of, you know, tanks on the roof there behind shields and things that will take and run the bus on natural gas. So you could run it off of natural gas, and that's probably what we'll see happening here. Okay, so we got car sharing is one way on the personal vehicle. What, what else could you do with the personal car? If you're driving a car that gets 18 miles per gallon, What's the, what's the, that's the next best thing to do? Pardon? <laughs> Give that girl a gold star. Stop using it for one thing. Right, that's the fastest way, right? So if you want to solve the problem, which is what I do most of the time, I work from home. I telecommute. So the car sits out in the garage. It doesn't, you, the most efficient car in the world is the one that, never used, that you never turn on. <laughs> right? Stays there, okay? So that's one way. So you, you park it, walk, find other ways. Yes? Yeah. I'm guessing only use it for trips that are like more than a couple blocks away. Mm hmm Yep. Right. So, so rethink about what you use the vehicle for. But what's the most obvious thing? You go from a car that gets 18 to a car that gets 30, right? I mean, that seems like... The most obvious, if you can afford it, obviously. I mean, there's, you know, cost issues and things you have to take into consideration. So you scale the car. There's many other things we can get into. I don't want to, you know, get bogged down by that. So you can redesign the car, right? So instead of the car running on that, that gasoline banger doing this all the time, what else could you be running that car on? An electric motor. We'll talk about ethanol in a minute. An electric motor. You can run that car on an electric motor. Now, of course, that's kind of where the Nissan Leaf, have you heard of the Nissan Leaf? Chevy Volt. Okay. All right, these are all cars that the major car manufacturers are going to be coming out with here starting this year. The Volt will be the first one to hit the roads right around November, start going on sale in, uh, in, in the first part of, of next year. So, yeah, can you hold just a sec? Um, so we got, so you can electrify. Now, why is electrifying the car a way to go? How, how, well, good. We're going to talk about energy in just a minute. How efficient is an internal combustion engine? Anybody know? 25%. Yep. At its best, by the time the energy actually gets to the wheels, it's more like 15% efficient. So 85% of the energy that you just paid for in that, take a dollar bill out of your pocket, or in this case, what is it, $2.60 or something like that, you know. Take a dollar bill out of your pocket, cut most of it away, and burn it. 
because that's what's happening when you put a gallon of gasoline into an internal combustion engine. Most of it never gets used for what it was intended to do. It's all waste heat. So that's how inefficient they are. Now, take an electric motor. Runs your refrigerator, runs your CD player, runs computer disk drives. Take the electric motor. How efficient do you think that is? At least 85, and most are up in the 90 to 95 percent. Some, some really advanced motors in the 95 percent range. Huge difference. Huge difference. Now, it is true that by the time you get from the smokestack, where the electricity is being generated by coal or from the nuclear power plant and so on, there is loss along, along the way, right? But even at that loss, by the time it gets into that car and propels that car, even with those losses, the electric car is still 30 to 35 percent efficient. So that's one of the reasons why you see the car companies going that direction. Because they want to, they, they need to make the cars more efficient. And you know what an electric motor doesn't do? It has no emissions. Now, it has emissions depending on where the power source is. You know, if you've got a bunch of solar panels, and I know people that have the solar panels on the roof, it does it. Okay, so let's talk about fuel. So we can do different things with cars. We can redesign how the car works. There's a friend of mine who's designed a car. This is really fun. It looks like a regular car when you look at it from the side, right? When you turn it this way, it looks like this. That's the driver. And the very first person to buy this car from this friend of mine up in Spokane, Washington was George Clooney. I've actually ridden in George, George Clooney's electric car. But the whole idea of this thing is first of all it's short, but more importantly it's narrow. Because the other problem you have to deal with, and this gets down into the third one, policy and planning. The other problem you have to deal with is what if every car on the road were electric and, 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 and generated no local source pollution? You'd still have the problem of traffic congestion, right? You'd still have all those cars on the road, you'd still have the traffic congestion problem. What the Tango, and this is what's called the Tango, what the Tango does is suddenly instead of having one car in a lane, now you've effectively doubled the capacity of the road because you can now have two cars in the same lane. It's really a cool idea. You'll probably start to see more and more of those concepts coming. They won't be in vogue here, you know, within the next five years or so. But I'm guessing that by the time we get out to that 2030 date, we're going to see some really different kinds of vehicles that are out there, just simply for all of the reasons we're talking about. Okay, so let's talk about fuels. So what are the fuel choices? If, we can't, if, not, if everybody can't have gasoline, so what are the fuel choices? Ethanol being one, okay, we'll call that a biofuel, right, for now. Okay, what a, Solar. pardon? Solar, Solar. so we could have, uh, we'll call that renewables. And under that we can have wind, solar, um, I'm going to call, uh, we could do geothermal in there in some cases. Pardon? Yeah, exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying. All these renewables, there's another option, of course, we can add in here. We can go with nuclear. Okay, yes? Well, yeah, that's what I'm going to say. The other one here would be uh, what we call hydrokinetics. And hydrokinetics is tapping the power of essentially flowing water. It'd be like hydro dams. Uh, a, a colleague of mine has developed a system that actually you can put it in a river and it'll generate power just from the river flowing by it.